Hey people, welcome back to Revival on the Air today. I'm uh, joined this evening by Brendan. How you are, man? Good, thanks, Ben. Yourself? I'm, uh, I'm pretty good, pretty good. So we're, uh, we're in Brendan's home. He's sort of bacheloring, if that's the right term, bacheloring. I'm not quite sure that's the right term or not. We're, um, Sands your wife. She's, uh, she's, is she down at camp? Yeah, she is down at our kids' camp in the kitchen at the moment. Yeah, right, cool. And you've got a couple of your kids here in bed at the moment? Yeah, two of the three, and uh, they're in bed at the moment, which is always a win. It's always a win, <laughs> which is pretty good effort going. It's only 8.30 at night. There's no yeah. way I'm getting my kids into bed by 8.30 I'll at let, night. I'll let them stay up for an extra hour. So You know we're recording this, right? Yeah. Right. You're not going to get in trouble with nah, Michelle, fine. right? You're good? All good, man. All good. <laughs> How good is kids' camp? Uh Oh, it's pretty good. It's it's definitely uh, you you walk away a bit excited. You know, you hear some good things and a lot of a lot of high energy. So mm. it's it's always a, a good thing to mm. to invigorate yourself. So for those that don't know, we our our, our church camp down at a site called Karakalinga. We have a, an annual kids camp, which is for kids around the ages up till the age of twelve ish, thirteen, I think, up to sort of high school yeah, type thing. And it's Massively full on, several hundred kids all down there, staying in dorms, in teams, learning about God, having fun, singing you know choruses and you know songs about Jesus, and just full on. And they just they just so into it, aren't they? Oh, I love it! Like it's it's so good. Whether it's whether it's the choruses or having fun down the beach or or at night time before they go and go to bed, getting getting down and serious and talking about about the Lord and, and about the important things to them. It's pretty amazing. I remember talking to somebody once at work about that I was going down to a to a kids camp and I was helping out. I was one of the one of the leaders down there and they said they couldn't think of anything worse than having, you know, responsibility for three hundred, you know, kids. But it's just such an uplifting environment for our, us adults. We come away so enthused and excited about the the energy and the and the love that they have for for God. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely, mate. I was one of those guys that was uh, couldn't think anything worse than uh, spending a weekend with a bunch of kids. But when you get down there, it uh, changes your mindset quite severely. Mm. So you, uh, so you, unlike me, didn't grow up knowing God, did you? No, not at all. It wasn't really a, a word that was mentioned in, in our household at all. Yep. So what? So tell me your story. Where, where did it, where did your journey to come to know God start? So I received the Holy Spirit. And spoke in tongues on the 19th of October 2008, so almost nine years ago now. So it's not that long ago, really. No, not really. It's it's gone pretty quick. Uh, it sort of feels just like yesterday. But before that, probably about three months before that, I reckon, maybe give or take a little bit of time, um, a guy I was living with um, by the name of Grant was instantly healed of an ice addiction that had consumed his life. He um, The day I moved in with him, I sort of only knew him through... My work, I was a barman and and he was just a customer and he heard that I needed somewhere to live and then basically, um, yeah, offered me a place to live. And the day I moved in, he um, he rang me and was on his way to rehab. He left a key for me in the little electrical box on the side of the house and just said, do what you want. I'll see you in a week. Came home at the end of a week, highs a kite and, and that was that. And, you know, probably a couple of weeks went by and maybe a month and then... Yeah, he just came home and he was different and he just said that he'd been to this church meeting and and, and he got baptized and, and he was he was just full of life and and it wasn't till till a little bit later on that I that I heard about the Holy Spirit and about a personal relationship with God. But you could see that there was this instant change in him. Like instantly the drugs left, the the lifestyle, the party the party way of life that he had was instantly gone and he became a Christian and it was and it was an amazing thing just to sit there and to watch. That would have been bizarre to, oh. to have known him, you know, before that and just to see that instant transformation. Oh, it was crazy. Like, this guy was so well known on the South Coast. He he was just this, this party animal, drug addict. He was a, like, owned his own business, was doing heaps of money on, on drugs. And yeah. It consumed his life. But as, as hardcore and as well known as he was for that, when – when God changed his life, it was almost like he's, he went back out again. Like he was that well known for yeah. for this Jesus guy that, that, that God had changed his life. Yeah, so, yeah. and just to be a witness to that, like you kind of tell that he wasn't putting it on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Wow, that, that would have been fantastic to watch. So, what was your life like before you knew Grant, before you knew him? Like before you moved in, what was your what was your life before that? Yeah, so I guess I guess a bit of a snapshot. Um, grew up, um, mum and dad were married. Um, they divorced when I was five. Um, got a younger brother as well. He, um, but yeah, they divorced when I was pretty young. Um, marriage wasn't wasn't crush hot. Um, mum mum had been having an affairs, and, and, and dad had had been a bit loose with his morals as well and it just wasn't a happy place and it was a wasn't a particularly um loving environment uh, a lot of fighting a lot of arguing a lot of violence um mum and dad particularly uh, quite violent towards each other and i guess um really you know growing up you sort of look to your parents for a bit of an example and for me anyway um i don't know i didn't really have a lot of direction um I uh, got hooked on the booze pretty hard when I was when I was a, when I was a bit younger and so from what age you reckon? Started drinking through through the footy club that I was a part of at about fifteen. Really? Wow. About about that. Yeah. Um, and I, I couldn't handle. I guess you know, you obviously as a, as a young buck when you're starting it, you can't really handle it that well. Did some, made some pretty stupid decisions. Um, but I was I become pretty violent. Like, you know, I'd black out a lot, getting a lot of fights and that was that when you're on the booze. Yeah, 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 yeah. when I was on the booze and, and a lot of that translated to I guess my I guess your normal life if you want to say that. Like I was ungrateful at home, I wasn't the best son. Um, you know, my mum as a single mum, she you know, she obviously had it pretty tough. I didn't really appreciate uh what she did for me at all. So I was I was a bit of a nightmare. Um and then at 16, I found myself living on the streets. Mum had had enough and we'd had this big fight one morning and, you know, she sort of told me to, to pack my gear and get out if that's the way, if that's what I thought. Um, so I packed my gear into my little turquoise uh, Toyota Corolla and... Uh, Pardon? Sorry. Turquoise. Turquoise Toyota, Toyota Corolla. Corolla. <laughs> so <laughs> it was my first car. It was this $500 bomb. <laughs> but I had a couple of boxes and some bags of clothing in there and... And off I went. You know, I was um, you couldn't really sleep in it, so I'd uh, I was working at Coles part time, but I'd um, yeah, I'd be sleeping on the beach down by the yacht club in Victor Harbour. Oh. Um, you know, sleep under the under a tree sometimes and stuff like that, and sort of you know, do a little bit of couch surfing, not heaps in between there. I always worked a couple of days a week, but back then it was pretty rare for you to be able to rent a house as a you know as a 16 year old by yourself yeah. and I've never particularly been too crash hot with money either so that didn't help the, the the situation but yeah so I was sort of doing year 12 and 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 that was going on and and then yeah I just sort of played footy with my mates and you know, trained and the rest of it and then just hit the grog and that was really a cycle that you know, continued and, and then I found myself, you know, various jobs and up in Lobethal and stuff like that, the slaughterhouses and just just no direction, just, just um, you know, I was in parks and stuff like that, working and, and swagging it out in the parks and that sort of stuff to uh, to survive and ended up back on the south coast uh, a few years later, still drinking, still no, still sort of couch surfing and, and then... Yeah, just over four four years working in in the pubs and and then ended up in Grant's place and you wow. know life had, life had gone in in just this vicious cycle of you know especially when I started at the pubs it was you know you drink most nights and you know generally you, you'd wake up still under the influence you go to work and do the same thing again yeah. and and you surrounded yourself with that and you lived that lifestyle and it was yeah. just something that. You know, it continued and just got worse. You know, the- what were, and so what were you thinking at this time? Like, did you did you did you recognise that this was not a life that you you know wanted to live, or did you did you understand what that might what the end outcome might be for you from a life, or were you just sort of blissfully unaware? No, nah, look, I wasn't unaware. I mean, I you know, I burnt I burnt a lot of bridges. Mm-hmm. I always thought of myself as a as a pretty polite polite young man, but then I was on this and I just lost control. Like, you know, I, I wouldn't know what I'd, what I'd done. I'd, I'd do things and I would hurt people. And, and I recognised pretty quickly that, you know, I was, I, was, I was getting in a lot of trouble, you know, whether it was, 
you know, it was funny, I didn't have much to do with my dad's family, but in, in the phone book, there's all these gloins and there's a lot of them with bees there. And I'm obviously a bee. So that they'd ring around trying to find where, where I was and they'd call my grandparents half the time because they, it was my granddad's name and all the, and all, all the people would be the police looking for me and stuff like that for stuff, you know, you couldn't remember doing or, or whatever. But I knew that, you know, like I knew my life wasn't going anywhere. I, I don't know where, I don't, I'd never had much direction or I um, didn't really have any role models or examples. Mm. But, you know, I also I wasn't a particularly strong person. Like yeah. I couldn't, you know, I was sort of in a hole and, and couldn't get myself out of it. And I yeah. thought it was, I just, just did what I knew. So when you saw this guy that you're living with, when you saw his life change, what did you think of that? Obviously you recognised the change, but did that spark an interest in you? Not immediately. Um, like, because Grant's so full on. Like, I guess he's like your typical addict. He, you know, when he's on a high, he's on a high. And then when he, when he crashes, he crash. And I think that I sort of thought that it was always a phase. Like, while what happened to him was, was you know, I, I knew something had happened to him and you couldn't deny it. But I always thought it was a phase. But, but he mentioned to me one time that he that he was at this like thing called a house meeting. Now I know, obviously, we do on a midweek. Um, so it's just at like a church meeting. That, yeah, yeah, instead of at a hall at somebody's house. Yeah, yep. yep. Yeah, like now it made sense to me. It makes sense to me now, but at the time, it sort of pricked my interest a bit. And he mentioned that it had been at uh, this, this this family this family um, called the Connor Graves that I that I knew. Um, like I knew I knew that the, the mum of the family. Um, when I was homeless, um, she was actually, I actually went in to get it, my first haircut in about, I don't know, almost a year, and she was the one that did it. And then I sort of got to build a bit of a bond over time with her, and I played footy with her son. And then I found out, you know, he was there, and it struck, it like, sort of began to struck a bit more of a chord with me then, okay. almost like a bit of credibility, because yep. I sort of knew someone, and I guess I didn't know Grant that well before I moved in with him, yep. but I knew this guy reasonably well. And and from there, I think things started to started to like clicking over in, in my head a bit more. I spent a bit more time with 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 him and and got to know got to know them and, and see a bit of an example there. So yeah. and then like then life changed for me. Like it got pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Um, like well while, while Grant's life was going up, mine mine hit the skids pretty badly. I. Uh, Gotten, gotten a pretty big blue one night. I uh, didn't remember. I didn't remember a thing about it. I'd started taking some drugs, and, and I wasn't big on that. But started taking some drugs and stuff like that. And I woke up the next day, and I had odds of blood on me and and stuff like that. And, and for me, I couldn't remember what had happened, and mm. I, it, it scared me. I yeah. remember, I remember getting home and just looking at myself in the mirror and and crying because I couldn't. You know, I, I just couldn't fathom what what my what my life was like. That, um, that you know, like that the guy that you know when you, you're a kid and you've got you know ambitions of what you want to do when you grow up. I just thought, you know, I'm so far removed from that 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 something's got to change, or I'm not going to be around much longer. Mm. That you know, something had to give. And then remember, you know, in those sort of situations, I think as a lad, you call your mum. You're like, oh, I'm going to give mum a call and yep. get some advice, but. I just remembered, that's when I remembered about Grant, you know, um, obviously this has been about three months or so later, but I just remembered what happened to him and I just thought, don't know whether this Jesus thing's for me, but something's got to change in my life, you know, yep. I've got to, got to try something and, you know, out of that I went to a, I went to a meeting the next week and where, obviously where Grant went, where they talked about God and they talked about, talked about good things and, you know, it was all right, I sort of, didn't really do anything, sat in a chair. and But I remember just one person came up to me and just said, it's really good to see you here. And for me, it sort of it sort of left an imprint. Mm. And, you know, I went away and I thought about things for, for a week and, and just, you know, the people and that. And then I remember a week later on the Friday night, we had all these young people from the church come to our house. There was about, about 30 or 40 of them. They were, you know, ranging between... 16 and, and probably 30 mm-hmm. and you know I, I came I knocked off work came home and 
I wasn't too keen on having all these church guys there. I thought, oh, you couldn't really think anything worse. <laughs> to be to be perfectly honest, I thought, oh, no, it's my Friday night. I didn't really want to hang out with all these nerds. <laughs> but but I walked in the door, man, and like there were guys just playing cards. They were we had a trampoline and and, and stuff at the house and bouncing on the trampoline, wrestling. Like it was for me, like growing up in such a football like sporting culture. It was massive that that there were these guys that were Christians but we just had fun. And what I guess what hit it on the head was at the end of the night, like all the lads stayed down at our place that night and they all went out on the boat the next day, wakeboarding and stuff like that. But at the end of the night, like they could have fun, but they got back to what was important. And one of the brothers there, or one of the, the, the men that came down, he sort of said, oh, look, we're going to have some prayer now. Like, do you, and they asked me if I minded. You know, I bowed my head... But it really hit home that what was important to these guys was God, mm. and you know. And I said, you know, there was no leaders or whatever there. It was just these these young guys that sort of thought this was important. And I had you know five ten minutes of prayer, and and I went off to bed that night, and I sort of thought in my head that you know that they've got something that I don't have. There must be a massive contrast to probably the parties and other things you'd have if you, you know, if you're going to have thirty lads over from the footy club on a Friday night. I can imagine that would be a completely different environment to, to what you saw that night. Yeah, like it was it was really cool. I mean, like the guys, I guess the guys were the same. If I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, they were, like it was the same sort of guys that I, that I was. But they didn't drink, they didn't smoke, they didn't do drugs. You know, they weren't lewd jokes about the girls yeah. or, or or anything like that. You know, no swearing. They were clean guys, but but we were the same. Mm. Like they were different, and they were different at the same time. I don't know if it makes sense, but you know, I know now that they all had the Holy Spirit, mm. and that they were, you know, they were different to me. But we had the same interests. I think it proved to me that I guess the stigma that I had about Christians, you know, like I said, not wanting to hang out with these nerdy guys on a Friday night, that for me that it showed that that Christians were normal people. That you could, you know, you could have a belief in God, but and 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 you know, have something like true and, and powerful there. But you, they were st- normal people; they weren't just like weirdos in a corner. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So what did what did you do next? Yeah. So, uh, next morning I fired off a text to like the one of one of the um to the guy I knew that I played footy with that was at this church, and I sort of said to him, oh. You know, I, I want to pray for this Holy Spirit. Um, you know, can we do it tomorrow? And he sort of said, "Yeah, no worries. Let's do it then." So, next day we got to the meeting, and um, I, you know, we went out to the prayer room uh, when, when it was time for prayer, and um, they just they just encouraged me to pray. And I, you know, pretty foreign to me. I've sort of been in the church once or twice in my life, but never never anything like that. And they said, "Let's let's have some prayer." And I was like, "Okay." They sort of encouraged me to say Hallelujah and. But I didn't say anything. I just opened my mouth and spoke in tongues. You know, nothing. I didn't have a chance to say anything, and I, and I knew I had. Like it was, it was quiet, but I knew something. Something inside me changed, and I remember. So you knew at that point you received the Holy yeah. Spirit because you spoke in tongues. Yeah. Yeah. Like I just, I just knew. Like no one sort of showed me in, in the scriptures, but I, but in, in inside me, I knew. Like I quietly, I quietly spoke in tongues, and I just knew. Yeah. And I got baptized. I got baptized straight afterwards. Yeah. Um, and and look, instantly things changed for me. You know, instantly the the drinking left. Instantly. So just the desire, like just it was everything. Just yeah, not there anymore. I just I went from a guy that you know after every shift would have to have at least sort of five, six, seven beers. Wow. To or and on my days off, just just getting written off completely. To someone, I just didn't have a desire to do it. Like mm. just, it just instantly left, mm. you know. And I've never, I've never picked up a drink since. You know, it's almost, it's almost nine. And it's almost nine years to the day, and and you know the the violent, the violence left. You know, the the temper, the temper, everything like that left. I, you know, I got direction in my life. The, the language stopped. You know, the desire to sleep around, all of that sort of stuff. The the the, the cultural stuff that I had ingrained in me was mm. gone. And you know, I never like I never asked for that. You know, I never, I never asked for for any of, of that to happen. But I just needed to know that there was more out there. And you know, instantly it happened. And I think if it hadn't happened there, then I wouldn't have gone back. Mm. Wow, yeah. it's actually really hard to be here in your home and knowing you. And we haven't known each other, you know, 
for those nine years. I've known you for probably the last few years. But it's actually really hard to reconcile this man that's sitting in front of me. And I know that you've got a face for radio. And I, but, <laughs> <laughs> but this man who I'm sitting here in front of in his lovely home with, and I'm looking behind you on the wall and there's a picture of your wife with your three gorgeous children and knowing who you are and you know, how involved you are in the church and your, the role that you play and etc. it's actually really hard to reconcile who you, know, who you are today compared to who you must have been. It, it almost seems impossible. Uh, but that's the power of how God changes our lives, isn't it? Yeah, and look, it, it honestly feels sometimes, you know, a little flashback or whatever, but it honestly feels like a dream sometimes. I that, imagine, yeah. You know, that that life was sort of, it was all, it's all a bit murky and, and you know, it didn't really happen. But then again, you're thinking some of the stuff was, 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 was as plain as day, but it was just amazing because, you know, I was never, never had direction. Like mm. I sort of went you know, one job to the next and, and, you know, I wasn't particularly educated or anything like that. You know, I did year 12, and but not probably not in the best um, circumstances. But it's just amazing, like, to see what, what God's done and, you know, to, to sit down with, with you know, my family and realize, you know, particularly, like, my mum and, and talk to her about, you know, where she thought I was at. You mm. know, they thought that, you know, that by the time I was 30, I'd be dead or in jail. That was that was the pencil, the mark they'd put next to my name. Are you 30 yet? Yeah, thirty two now. Nice. So nice, you're two years over. That's I know I ticked the milestone. So, <laughs> but it's yeah, it's just hearing. I think for me, hearing what other people thought of me was a bit of a shock. Yeah, like right. I I didn't really think I was that bad. Yeah, you know, and I guess in some ways I still don't. But hearing you know what your loved ones thought of you, and you know, um, I guess the life you were living, you sort of really hits home a bit. Yeah, yeah, I think. Sometimes it's hard to be so self-aware. Yeah. Whereas others are, others see it plain as day, don't they? Oh, absolutely. It's actually quite, it's actually quite miraculous, isn't it? That you're leading a life with a desire to do something different, but that difference never coming. But then overnight, not because you have a desire to be a Christian, but because you receive the Holy Spirit, get baptized, and then your life completely transform us. It actually really does bring to life the scripture about being you know, and I know born again is a is is a term that's pretty loosely used out in, in Christianity today, but we you know, we read, you know, in the New Testament about you know, that is a term that's used about uh, you know, effectively a new birth. And that's really what you had. You're a new you're a new person. Yeah. A hundred percent, you know, um I you know, I, I couldn't have done it by myself. Like mm. so I was, you know, the amount of times you'd wake up after a night out, or, or you'd do something dumb, and you'd go, "Oh, I've got to change, and you know, I've got to get my act together." And all the amount of times you'd have other people tap you on the shoulders and say, "Look, you got to pull your head in a bit, Brendan," yeah, and stuff like that. But you know, I know if it wasn't for if it wasn't for God, then there's no way that I, I could have done it. You know, there's no way that I could have stopped drinking or. or you know, changed any aspect of my life, yeah. you know, just because of the, the person I am. And, you know, I never, I never thought about having a family, you know, I never thought about having kids, a wife, um, or, or, you know, a house or anything like that. You know, I was always a, I was always a, a day to day person. I never really, I never really thought about the future or put much stock in, you know, what I wanted out of life, but I never had a plan. Yeah. But, you know, God, God obviously had a, had quite a different plan to what I thought. That's cool, isn't it? Oh, oh, it's amazing, man! Like, really it's cool. it's one it's one of the most humbling things, mm. you know, to sit there and look at the kids and to go, you know, wow! If it wasn't for if it wasn't for God's intervention, that they wouldn't be there. You got three gorgeous children, a gorgeous wife, who I'm sure are, are very thankful every day that God changed you from who you were to who you are today. So that's pretty. Oh, awesome. I hope so. <laughs> Look, they're smiling in the photo, so that's you know, no, absolutely guaranteed that that's the case. Yeah. That's very cool. Awesome. Well, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty big miracule, isn't it? Yeah, um, you know, and it's, it's been some amazing. Have you seen other miracles? Have you seen other things you know, happen in other people's lives or other you know, miraculous things since yeah. since that time? Seen, seen heaps. So, I've got, I've got, I've got heaps. You know, it's one of those things. It's no nine years, and you see so much stuff. Mm. Um, you know, my daughter Olivia, our eldest, um, Michelle tells the story heaps better. I'm, I forget. I don't know all the sciencey. 
the sciencey stuff. Maybe I should get her back. Yeah, you dog her in. But um, <laughs> but really, she at the six month scan, Michelle and I sort of had the idea that when the person did the scan, that that it wasn't quite wasn't quite hunky dory. There was there was something something was happening. Just it just took ages. You know, she was scanning us for so long, and we both walked away with a like, oh, you know, something doesn't seem too right. But Michelle got called into the doctors on the Monday and, and told to go straight to uh, Flinders that mm-hmm. she needed to, um, you know, see a specialist down there and, and stuff like that. And it ended up in it ended up turning out that they measured that Olivia's brain one side was 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 bigger than the other, and that they were they were throwing around words like you know she's not going to be compatible with life that you know that she's going to be you know wheelchair like you know quadriplegia type paraplegia wow. type situation that there was no. Uh, it wasn't enough fluid getting to the spine and and that, you know, we'd have to have this late stage termination. So we needed to come in and talk to a specialist and stuff like that. And and I remember Michelle called me and she wasn't in a good place. Um, drove in from work, you know, her and her mum were at the hospital and they'd been praying together and I drove in and was praying. And, and I remember getting out the car and just thinking, you know, like, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, they're talking termination, but, you know, that's not us. You know, we, you know, who are we to, who are we to, say what gift God gives us is is good enough. And doctors don't throw terms like that to freak a you know, to freak <laughs> to freak a pregnant a pregnant no. woman out, right, without being pretty confident that there's yeah. something going on. And like Michelle's pretty stubborn and, and she demanded like, you know, they wanted her to like stick a needle in her belly, which is a height like a reasonable chance of like, you know, doing something to the baby or miscarriaging yep. and that sort of stuff. But Michelle's like, no, 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 just give us another scan. And, I was, and as I'd sort of pulled up at the hospital at this point and just sort of had that thing of like, you know what, God's got it covered. Like, no matter what the result, you know, we love our child and, and it's all good. But, you know, they, they did this other scan and then it came back that there was nothing, you know, it came back that there was nothing wrong and we had the two results and stuff like that to say, hey, this is what this is what your scan originally was and this was the normal one. And, and they, like, we okay. had to... And, and the only difference, the only thing that changed in between those two things was a bunch of prayer. Yeah, yeah. They had a scan from the Friday and then a yeah. scan from the Monday. And what did and you then, so what was the weekend? What was the weekend? We didn't like? know. Like, well, they didn't call Michelle till the Monday. So, like, we had no idea. We just mm. left because Michelle did this thing with her GP and went in yeah. and saw them, like, once a fortnight or whatever. Yeah. And, and she just was going to her GP and he's like, go to the hospital. You know, this is the issue. Mm. And so she went in and, you know, it was all crying and and tears and stuff like that but but yeah like we just both had this had this assurance that god was going to look after it and you know and, and olivia had issues when she was born as well like she was you know perfect size and everything and in a human crib and they're like oh you know then they once again brought up the brain thing and and that's when we knew that no nah, there's nothing wrong with her because god healed her it's, god healed her in the womb yep like when we got those scans back and she was perfect and they scanned for everything else and there was nothing wrong with her and but we just knew that, you know, we prayed about it and God answered and he doesn't take it back. Mm. You know, it's not like, oh, I've healed her, but then I'm going to remove her. Yep. And, you know, that was amazing. And she's just the happiest, most active, she's the smartest kid. You know, you know remember, she's, you're not, only, she's almost four. You're not biased at all, hey, mate? No, honestly, I'm, <laughs> I'm the most unbiased person you ever meet. But, no, she's, but she's, she's so far advanced mm. and... To have a doctor say, you know, she's not going to be compatible with life and, you know, she's going to be, you know, wheelchair bound and, and have, you know, like, have, like, you know, no no quality wow. is, you know, it's huge. You know, and I guess, you know, for people that don't have God and they're confronted with that and they go, well, we're going to terminate compared to going, well, we're going to pray and trust that God answers and he does. Bingo. Yeah, and, and I remember... Um, oh, Years ago, I was pretty. It was pretty fresh. Pretty fresh coming to the church and with the Holy Spirit and stuff. And I remember I got asked to pray for one of my mum's friends that was she'd had this brain aneurysm burst in her head, and they took her to hospital and stuff like that. And um, when she got the hospital, they'd operated, and and her family was sort of all called in, and she couldn't remember her husband, and um, was paralysed on like one side of her body. I think it was the left side, and. Then they, she's gone into this coma and they called the family and to say goodbye. And, you know, mum's like, can you pray for her? And I was, um, I was living in a boy's house at the time up at, up at Pasadena with some other guys in the church. And, and we just decided to have a prayer and fast for her. Didn't know what was happening at the hospital. We just knew it was all, it was no good. Yeah. 
but you know, so I said to mum that look, God's going to heal her and, and it's going to be fine. You know, it's all going to work out. And they um they were they were turning the life support off when we finished our prayer and fast. And the first she woke up and it was unexpected. They'd said goodbyes. They were all around there, but the life support's been turned off. And she reaches out uh, like mum's friend reaches out with the left hand. I think it was the left hand side of her body, which was paralyzed, grabs her husband's hand, who she couldn't recognize, and looks at him and says, says I love you so much. Wow. You know? And it was, and I, it was amazing. And, you know, nothing came of it. Nothing, you know, no one, no one came to the Lord or anything like that. But I know for me, I just thought that. Did your mum recognize that it was a miracle? Yeah. I mean, at the time, mm. everyone was like, oh. I, I'm guessing everybody recognized yeah, it. Yeah. At the time, everyone's like, yeah, God's done this. Woo. But no, nah, look, uh, nothing. But nothing ended up coming from it. But for me, I just, I just thought that you know, this is like, this is what it's about. This is, this is, this is what we read in the New Testament. Yeah. This is what we read when Jesus was around. This yeah. is what we, you know, he healed people just like that. That's that's exactly right. Yeah. You know, this is the stuff that I read in my Bible yep. happening to me. Yep. You know, like, absolutely. Like the promises that it says in there is happening to me. And I, I mean, I wasn't there. I'm not some miraculous healer but it was just me and some lads in our dingy house saying we're just going to pray we're just going to pray for this person and and it happened you know mm. and, and it's and, it, and it's cool like it is it's, cool. It, it's it's cool just to think that you know what that all those years ago when i just thought you know i don't know whether this jesus guy's for me that that you know now he is you know he proved himself to me and i can't think of anything else i want to do with my life man like it's it is it is out of this world the stuff that i get to to, to see every day you know seeing people receive the holy spirit for themselves yeah and you know seeing seeing their life change as as they learn what it's like to to, to be able to pray and to be able to expect that god does things mm. praise god man that is so cool yeah Thanks heaps for sharing your story. Nah, any time. Now I, uh, you got a favourite scripture for me? What do you got? Yeah, so First Corinthians fifteen and verse ten. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I laboured more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. But by the grace of God, you know those miraculous things have happened to you. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's awesome, man. Thanks, man, for sharing your story. Uh, thanks for having me, Ben. Awesome. All right. Well, we might uh, we might wrap it up there. If um, if you want to hear more testimonies of what God's done people in, in people's lives, visit www.revivalontheairtoday.com. Uh, on there are the various podcast apps you can go to to uh, listen, or you can listen just straight off there. Don't forget to review and rate us so we can get the word out there more. And uh, thanks heaps for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time. God bless.